Um, so I thought that we would start with Graft, which is the first book um, coming out this year. It's coming out on the 24th of June. Um, and the translator is James Trapp and the editor is David Lamy. And so I was wondering before we hear a little bit from Lee Pifu, um, who is the author of the book to sort of, I wonder if David, uh, James, you would be able to introduce it a little bit for us. Um, what is Graft all about? Um, Excellent. Okay, Shamba. Can you keep this thing? Waiting for the effect to slide down. Now we do. Is that reasonable yes. for everybody? Yeah. So what's Graft about? Um, I suppose it's essentially about a series of conflicts. Um, conflict between honesty and corruption. Um, conflict between um, the countryside and the city uh, and, and conflict between generations. Um, the story essentially centers around the intertwined lives of several people. At, at, at the heart of it is, a, is a, um, an honest um, academic, um, agricultural academic, um, who almost through no fault of his own found, finds himself um, rising through the ranks of local government to be deputy provincial governor. Um, and around him, and particularly involved with him, um, is, a, is a, um, a young country lad made good, um, who somehow attaches himself to the, to the professor at university and then manages to follow him um, several steps behind up the, um, up the ladder. Um, and so one part of the story is, is about um, their relationship um, and where it takes them, um, and where it takes them and particularly the, 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 the unfortunate uh, professor is into a, um, a web of corruption um, in which he eventually becomes the fall guy and he's executed um, for the murder of his second wife. Um, along the way, we, we, um, we're told the story of the professor, um, of his rise from being a, um, a poor peasant, uh, son of a peasant farmer, um, and his time in, um, as, a, as a, a, a prize student and study in the United States and so on. Um, and we also follow the career. In fact, the first character we meet really is, is his, um, his sidekick, um, who is the son of a, um, a master gardener, a master um, bonsai, for want of a better word, producer. And how, I don't know how many people know that bonsai is originally Jap uh, Chinese, not Japanese. Um, and the, the reason the, um, we gave the book the title Graft is because the book is kind of bookended by this um, master gardener's quest to create the perfect um, miniature flowering plum um, and um, the struggles he goes through to, to, to create that uh, and its ultimate um, failure. So there's, there's, a, there's an allegory there. Um, along the way, so we, uh, along the way, the, the themes that we meet, this, apart from this overriding theme of corruption or graft, um, are conflict between um, the city and the country, because our main protagonists are, are country folk. Um, and this causes problems um, um, between the professor and his, his first wife, and then his second wife, who is his ultimate downfall. Um, and we have some very vivid descriptions of, of life in the, in the North Chinese, uh, in a North Chinese country village. Um, the other main protagonist and the other theme is, is, is um, a fairly detailed um, description of a, of a complex police investigation um, and how um, an old school police officer, again, um, possibly being used as fall guys, put in charge of a very complex corruption, a very complex corruption case that surrounds um, the, um, the provincial governor. So it's, um, I seem to be wandering slightly because the, 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 the book, one, it doesn't wander, but it takes you on a, on a, on a, on a meandering path through all, uh, through all these themes, but running through it all is this, this idea of, um, of graft, of corruption, uh, its consequences and how many people, innocent people it, it involves. Um, I'd say it was a book that, that when translating, I couldn't get, wait to get back to. I found myself really carried along by it, getting involved with characters, wanting to know what happened to them. Um, and it's, it's a very carefully crafted um, novel, I think, and, and, and well worth reading. 
think that's all I've got to say, which is quite short by my standards. <laughs> you did excellently. Caitlin, we have the video ready, if, yeah. if you're ready for that. Shu 卖花人在平原应该说这部长篇被车轮碾碎的蝴蝶呢这个新闻在我脑海里留下了深刻印象亿万富翁从事平原的写作使他们在时代的潮头上挣扎拼搏是一个大戏台。Well, let's get talking about it, James. So, um, you said in particular, um, that this was a book that you couldn't wait to get back to. How was the translation process overall? Was it a difficult book or was it an easy book to translate? I, 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 in the echo chamber. Um, I only came back, uh, came, got your um, tail end of your question, but you were asking how it was to translate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, as I said, it, yes, it, it, because it, I, I got so involved, I suppose I, I found it um, very sympathetic to translate. I don't remember encountering any huge difficulties. There is some dialect, obviously, when they're out in the villages, um, and so on with, with um, this some dialect, but not um, not enough to, to to really make a challenge. Um, so yeah, it wasn't um, it wasn't a difficult 
book to translate at all. Um, uh, particularly, as I say, because it it felt so sympathetic and and and, and drew you in. So. Yeah, I can't remember there being any specific problems with it, which is, is really rather nice for a translation. <laughs> it is indeed, isn't it? Um, and so, David, I wonder if you could slightly introduce what the role of an editor does and as opposed to a translator and then um, how you came to work on Graft as well. Yes, OK. Well, the role of the book editor with um, a translated uh, piece of work is a slightly different as if you, if you were editing a, uh, an English writer in the sense that you don't get involved at the outset of the book, you don't get to discuss um, some of the issues or talk about the structures. You're, you're presented with a finally published book, which has already been published in the native language. So it's, it's more uh, a sort of copy editing exercise, working with the translator to iron out any issues, um, any possible inconsistencies, uh, sometimes going back to the publisher or, um, or, or the author to clarify issues. But essentially it's, it's trying to make the book uh, readable and make sense to the English reader. And in many cases you get situations, for example, where references are made, they could be historical references or cultural references, which are well known to the Chinese but wouldn't necessarily be known to uh, an English language reader. So you have to work that bit harder, I think, to, to, to make these references understood without trying to get in the way of the story and make it too clunky and have lots of footnotes. So that's, that's an additional challenge with a, with a translated piece of work. And was, how was Graft itself? Have you edited it in full yet or is that in the process currently? No, Graft is, I think, the only one. Of, of the full books above it, which is being edited and it's it's pretty much ready to go. Yeah. Um, and was that process? Uh, do the do they vary? Was it is it sort of like in a very common complaint translate not complaint but difficulty like sort of James was alluding to is that of dialogue or specifics like you can't necessarily translate an accent if you put it in English. You maybe are then picking a English or um. British or American um, accent to translate into? Was there anything like that with Graft um, that was a particular editing challenge? Um, not, not particularly. I think one of the challenges you get is with um, is actually just keeping track of the different characters. And for, as I say, for an English reader, you often get uh, the, the names wouldn't be familiar and it's therefore hard to lock onto who is who. And often the names are very similar and difficult to differentiate. So you have to, as, as I say, you have to work a bit harder just to remind the reader who these people are. Otherwise, you're constantly flicking back to check, uh, check, check who it is. So you might say, you know, the barber or, you know, the protagonist's cousin or whatever. So it's, it's, it's just helping uh, uh, along as you go. And um, before we turn again and try to give that video another chance, um, I was just wondering if what for both of you is the most important or unique aspect um, of graft, you know, you can take that question in any way you like and um, definitely importance can also mean importance to you. What did um, you like particularly about this book? Um, I liked its immediacy. Um, I, you found yourself um, drawn into this story and into the characters um, very quickly and very easily and, and, and you develop uh, or I developed um, opinions about them very fast and, and um, found myself rooting for the poor professor um, and, and actually feeling sorry for the police um, chief and so on. So it, it's a very involving, I found it a very involving book. I like the fact that it was um, based on a true story. When you read it, you're sort of thinking this is a bit far-fetched and you know, could this have happened, but it's actually very closely follows an actual story of a an academic who rose through the political ranks, killed his wife and ended up being executed. So very faithful to an actual event. So um, I guess my question um, on hearing that is, and you've mentioned it a little bit already, like this concept of it being um, an absurd book and, you know, um, it was hard to believe that it was a real life story. Um, if you were to sort of talk about what kind of absurdity it is, um, how would you maybe describe that? You know, there's a comic absurdity, there's a sort of um, 
yeah there's the different ways in which something is surreal yes i can absurdity um it's the on the face of it the the um the involvements and the, the progress these people make and the the levels of, of everything seem to be exaggerated seem to be absurd um the depiction of the villagers um, and their behaviour when when the professor's first wife, who's a, who's a city girl, is taken back there and, and practically gang raped by by the village men. Um, the um, extraordinary depiction of the of, of um, the police uh, investigation and and this old school cops um, interrogation techniques and so on. It it um, it seems it, it seems exaggerated, except except you know that it's not. Um, it's uh, I suppose it's it's the vividness with which this is depicted that makes you feel this absurdity. Um, although that is that's overridden by the realization that this is actually true, and that's I suppose the power of the book is that 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 um, the truth is captured through its absurdity like that a lot and um, thank you so much um, James and David we'll come back to you in a little bit later um, but to move on to our second book a cherry on a pomegranate tree and um, a tree and um, this by Dave Hasem hello Dave how are you doing hi good thanks <laughs> thank you Yes, I can hear you. Um, there we are. So thank you so much for joining us. Um, I was wondering before we watch a clip of a cherry on a pomegranate tree, if you could introduce it for us um, and talk a little bit about um, the book itself. Sure. So um, A Cherry on a Pomegranate Tree is by Liar. Uh, it was originally published in 2004. And it follows the protagonist, Kong Fan Hua, who is the local village head. Uh, she's the only woman who is a village head in the county. And basically it's about her attempts to deal with all the various kind of challenges um, to her authority and the problems that she's dealing with as she approaches the, the local elections where she's hoping to, to keep her position as the village head. Um, so it's really about kind of watching her um, going about her, her work, um, dealing with all these other characters, interacting with all these other people in the village, um, there's the number one problem she has to deal with is the fact that she has to enforce the the one child policy um and there is a woman in the village who has got pregnant somehow has kind of slipped through the net of, of checking for pregnancies and then runs away so it's kind of almost got a little road trip element where they're kind of chasing after this this runaway woman trying to catch her down that's the kind of main driving force of the plot um, because that's the, the biggest challenge, but there's all these other threads as well. Um, there's also a the kind of treachery that she's dealing with from her rivals, the, the other people on the village council who are also kind of jockeying for power. Um, there's the rivalry with another local village, uh, Gongzhuang, who are also trying to kind of, um, there's various ways in which they're kind of battling for power. There's this local paper plant that they both want to control. Um, there's this kind of plot involving um, a burial just outside the village, this burial grave, uh, this burial mound where this um, old woman is meant to have, have meant to have committed suicide, is meant to have died. They were supposed to have um, uh, demolished this burial mound, but they didn't. And now People are trying to use this as an excuse to, to get her into trouble. Um, there's an American visitor supposedly coming. Everyone thinks there's this, there's this visitor coming. When's he going to be here? Um, potentially, it might be Jimmy Carter, they think at one point, um, who might bring some foreign investment. And again, you've got rivalry between all the different villages and, and local authorities. Um, her parents want her to have a have another child so she's dealing with uh, dealing with her pressure from her parents as well as her official position her husband Dianjin works in um works in a shoe factory in Shenzhen he comes back and is kind of acting shiftily there's there's something going on that he's not telling her so it's basically kind of following her as she tackles all these challenges um and for the most part it's it's quite satisfying just watching her dealing with all these problems she's uh, she's very competent at doing her job um, and then there's these, all these other subplots as well. There's a huge host of characters, lots and lots of people, um, all with quite distinctive voices and distinctive personalities. 
Um, there's subplots involving, um, there's like this local pickpocket who's just out of prison. She's trying to kind of get him back on the straight and narrow. He's got a crush on like her, her protege, um, a young woman called Meng Xiaohong. So there's all these kind of threads coming. The, the main kind of plot strands gradually converge as the novel um, continues and it gets closer and closer to the, to the local elections. Um, so that's what I think is, uh, it's, it's hard to summarize what the book is about because there's all these disparate elements, but um, I think that gives you some idea of some of the things that are going on. A little bit like Graft here, it's this huge, mm. like, uh, what's the word, um, plethora of different strands coming together into one book. And um, so let's hear a little bit from Lee, uh, if we can, Daniel. Yeah. Hello 一般情况下西方的读者不是非常了解以及中国城乡之间的共同点我的这本书和我的别的小说有些不同那么这本书对于我来讲当然丰富了我的创作，呃，它也给予了我很多很多的想法和感情。谢谢大家。Did Ying ask you to come and translate it? Was it a book that you pitched Ying? Um, what sort of relationship? What did you develop with this book? Um, so I actually translated this book uh, a few years ago. Um, so I've just been kind of revisiting and refamiliarizing myself with it. Um, I found it mostly a quite sort of smooth translation. Um, once I found the, the right voice for the book with these um, kind of occasional halts where um, there are these just like difficult, knotty problems that I, that I had to figure out. Um, one of the issues that is was a fun challenge, but a challenge is, is the fact that it's a very funny book. Like there's a lot of humor in this book um i really just reading the original there's there's lots of funny points in the book that um that made me laugh and so trying to convey that in the translation was um was often a challenge uh sometimes it's it's to do with the the dialogue and the kind of the perspective of uh, the protagonist um and that's that's sort of not too challenging from a technical perspective once you find the right voice but there is also things like puns and, and wordplay um, that are obviously much harder to translate. Um, there's there's one example I mentioned, like Jimmy Carter. They think Jimmy Carter is going to come to the village, and there's this joke about like Carter, and he'll be like Kajula. Like they're going to stop him before the the other higher authorities will stop him before he ever gets to to the village. Um, so they won't have a chance to see him, um, and that doesn't really translate very well into English. I kind of came up with some alternatives. So in this case, I said like he'll be carted off. By the authorities before they um before they have a chance to to see him so it's kind of the opposite idea he'll be taken away rather than he'll be like prevented from reaching the village um but with those kind of things you have to be a little bit more more flexible in trying to find some kind of equivalent um there's also 
one thing involving kind of bureaucratic terminology, um, the various official positions that different characters have, um, the different levels of hierarchy in the local bureaucracy, um, like you have the county town, um, then you have the township, then you have the village. Um, there's quite a few details like that where when I first started translating, I was maybe thinking it, it doesn't matter too much what the exact right term is. But then when you realize actually, as you go through, actually these are very important because they differentiate the different characters and the different locations. So you have to be more precise about translating those specific details. Um, and the other thing was just keeping track of all the characters. Um, there's so many characters and um, as we mentioned, talking about graft, um, it's hard to keep track of them when the names are transliterated into pinion because they don't have any semantic content. They're just sound. There's nothing to, to latch onto with those names. So where possible, I try to um, translate some of the names um, into English. Um, for example, there's a character called the, the Township Head. Um, his surname is Newell. And I translated that as Ox in English because it kind of sounds okay as a surname. And it also worked with some of the wordplay that was involved with his character. Um, so I also had to keep track of how I named the characters. Was this character, um, was his name a transliteration or was it a translation into English? And going back through, I, I had to figure out some, I noticed some inconsistencies and I had to try and uh, tidy those up. So those were some of the challenges that were particular to, to this novel. And um, what in particular do you like about this novel or you think is unique or, you know, so the thing that obviously is leaping out as me is that she is a female village head and that gender is an important part of this book. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, absolutely. I think she's really quite an unusual protagonist um, in, in Chinese literature. She's a really interesting character. Um, she's definitely facing the kind of um, the way the other characters belittle her uh, because of who she is. Um, that's one of the strong, strong elements of the story that um, that made it interesting to me. Um, the sense of humor is also um, a strength. And you heard Liar talking about some of the kind of political issues that he was interested in exploring in the story. And one thing I really appreciate is that it doesn't feel like those are forced into the story. It doesn't feel like the story is a vehicle for those ideas. Um, the characters are really well written and it really feels like those ideas are kind of quite smoothly integrated into the story and into the lives of the characters. It doesn't feel like an author is saying, okay, now I'm gonna talk about this political, this political topic I want to talk about. Um, it's, you kind of learn about those things, you, you get in touch with those ideas, but you don't feel like it's detached from the, from the main action of the story and from the characters of the story. Fantastic. All right, so very sad to leave. Uh, pomegranate tree uh yeah it is pomegranate <laughs> I thought it was cherry tree then but it's a cherry on a pomegranate tree <laughs> um and move on on to could you talk about that title actually just before I move sure, on I was, it's an interesting title yeah, I was yeah. maybe you should explain that it, it comes from this recurring kind of um like nursery rhyme that um the characters refer to in the novel it's basically um an idea that like everything is kind of the wrong way around so it's kind of like upside down um inside out upside down like uh a cherry growing on a pomegranate tree it's sort of like everything is is inverted everything is um, topsy-turvy and so sometimes that's used to refer to uh Kong Fan Hua, right like she is a woman but she's in a position of power that's like a cherry on a pomegranate tree that's that's topsy-turvy that's not the natural order of the universe um so that's part of what that title is referring to that's so instinctive. I feel like that's something that just immediately, I, yeah, I love that. <laughs> that's so good. I'll replace Topsy Turvy in my language with a cherry on a pomegranate tree. <laughs> um, so I just want to introduce Hai Wang Yun, um, who is going to talk about leading wave. Um, hello, lovely to see you again. Unmute. Hi. I just unmuted. How are you doing? I'm wondering. Good, how are you? Thank you. Very well. Thank you all for inviting me here. Not at all. It's an absolute honor to have you. I was wondering, so this is a co-translation with Will Spence. Yes, um, Will Spencer. Uh -huh. Who's not able to be here. Um, but I was wondering if you could do a little bit of an introduction um, to the book um, and talk a little bit about um, maybe also co-translating. Um, okay. What that is for people right. who might not know. Thank you. And I had the honor of translating this book with uh, Will Spencer 
And I translate the first part of it. Basically, it's half and half, and we'll translate the latter part of it. And uh, so, as you know, uh, the book uh, in the first part is kind of a preparing uh, the reader for what's going to happen. So most of the climax, the deaths, and uh, happened in the second part of it. And uh, I think the, the story uh, doesn't have many characters like all the other uh, uh, translators said. It has only three people and one horse. And, but uh, the background, in the background, there's thousands of uh, soldiers, of troops, you know. And, but actually, he just focused the, in the limelight, only the, uh, it's a brigade leader, uh, Xi Jin. And he's very talented. He uh, studied abroad and came back to join the war. And then uh, now got into the civil war too. But he was very talented and he got promoted each time he uh, got the, uh, he never got a deputy something, but he's always the leader, the leader, the theater commander. And then a girl from Beijing, for some reason he couldn't go to uh, where he, she was heading for. And for some reason, because the, uh, the enemy, uh, the Kuomintang uh, soldiers kind of a block, blocked everywhere. So for some reason, she just wound up uh, in the PLA and uh, saw this guy that was having a meeting and she was at a meeting. And uh, there was a very embarrassing uh, uh, moment when the soldiers kind of uh, was dissatisfied with the performers, but she went up to perform her Gu Qin. It's kind of a very ancient uh, instrument and you do this way. And uh, so, that guqin, that prop, became the link between the two. Because the two were all very highly intellectual. Not like all the, not typical of the Chinese soldiers, the peasants, illiterate. And so they just uh, fell in love in at first sight. But unfortunately, as the story developed, uh, the love, the relationship between them didn't develop as we uh, expected. It just ended up uh, tragically. And uh, I think uh, the, uh, the author, Xu Huaizhong, by the way, he's now 93 years old. That's why he cannot appear, right? Cannot even record his voice, unfortunately. Uh, he was born in 1929. At 12, at 12, he went to a school and then he joined the PLA after he graduated in, at 15. So actually, when you read the book, I follow the uh, Wang Ke Yu, the, the girl, you can see him. Actually, that what she does in the book is what he actually did. And he also worked as a propagandist, well, we call it the publicity, right? And in the army, uh -huh. and so she did the same job. So he's writing himself, I think. And um, so he, he's now a, a, major, uh, a major general. Um, so, in the, so he just started something new in Chinese literature in terms of the war novel genre. And even a few, a couple of decades ago, a lot of things in this book were taboo. And because heroes supposed to be lofty, as unsel unselfish, and couldn't, uh, cannot think about himself, his, in his interests and his feelings and love was taboo. And in, I got a lot of movies you can see on my back. So that's why I know the Chinese history and wars. And a lot of them, if you want to write love, you have to be insinuated and they have to be very subtle. But in this book, he just uh, kind of subverted the whole thing. He just focused not on the war, the battle, but on the people, on the relationship, even uh, the uh, the very personal, the very human part of it. 
uh, although uh, this guy, the leader, uh, studied abroad, but still he had the Chinese, the, 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 the very uh, Chinese uh, concept of virginity. That's how he destroyed the relationship. She wants to know if the girl was a virgin. So she, she broke up with him. And later she got killed in action. And uh, he was very regretful for that. And uh, there was another guy who was a messenger for him, taking care of his mount, the horse. Uh, it's, a, it's called the Tan Zhao. Um, and the, the horse, you know, uh, the war, it's called the a Thousand Li, Great Leap into Dabie Mountain. And everybody, <clears throat> I don't think uh, the, the, the one that translates, I have to interpret that a little bit because not uh, all the uh, Western readers know this. Uh, by the way, uh, the Sinoist publisher also published the uh, Chinese Communist Party uh, simple history, right? Uh, a brief history. You need to read that to know this part of it. And so that war is so crucial to the Chinese because after the anti-Japanese war uh, was over, uh, the communists and the, and the Kuomintang nationalists got into the civil war. And uh, of course, at that time, the nationalists were uh, at the upper hand in terms of all the uh, military uh, uh, power and uh, human power and weapons. Uh, so they just tried to wipe out the communists and it was almost did this. They even occupied the, the communist uh, headquarters in Yan'an. And, but, they, but the communists just kind of a take, I, I think it's a gamble. They send their army into the enemy's, uh, uh, the, into the enemy's uh, line. That's the Dabia So just, uh, uh, if it's if 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 it, if it failed, the comments would fail. If it was successful, as it turned out, so they will they will succeed. So that's the war. But it's very very uh, brutal, crucial. A lot of people died. So that's why the author made the girl die and made the horse die. And another. so that, that that I think he's tried to show how brutal the war is. I was, and um, so that's about the, the story. I can't just tell too much. I I I want the readers to read it. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> is it um when you read it? Is it a? Do you think that the language is brutal as well? Is the language and the structure brutal, or is the does that mirror in the events, or is it of a different style? Yeah, I'm talking about brutal uh, because of my background, because I know the war, the brutality of the war, but the book is not. In terms of language, the description, the, the story of the love story, it's very beautifully, romantically written. So it's a it's kind of a realistic uh, romance. So, yeah. So it's beautifully written. Yeah. Oh, gorgeous! <laughs> um, that's so exciting. And um, obviously, much of this history and you were familiar with. Um, you know, there's this sort of like uh, old advice that gets given to authors that they should always write what they know. Um, and in many ways, um, a translator has to also write you know every word in an English in the translation is an, yes. a translator writing it yes. um yes. so you know it's hard because the translator hasn't chosen to write what they know <laughs> you know you maybe haven't um, was there anything that you had to research or was there any um aspect of the book that you felt um was more of a challenge and you had to work through more uh, not very much, as I said, uh, since I grew up uh, in China until uh, I was something like a 30 you know, when I came in, in America, uh, came to America. I think uh, uh, as a translator, as all the uh, other translators said, you, it's not translating for yourself. Translation for translation is sick. You have to let your uh, target uh, language speaking reader understand it. Like over here, as I said, the prop is the Gu Qin, and the music is called the uh, 
高山流水, high mountains, flowing water. So, so actually behind that, there is a almost 3000 year old story. It's called the uh, that, that, and from that story that came uh, uh, the uh, Chinese uh, term, zhi yin, zhi yin means sworn uh, friends, very good friends. I know you, you know, you know um, all, all, all about me. And so there used to be a musician who played the Skuqin and only one guy, just he's a chopper, a wood chopper, understood, understood him and follow his, his, whether his, uh, his music shows the mountains or depicts uh, flowing water. So he said, well, I'll, uh, I'll visit you next time. But the next time when he visited him, he had already died. So he just crushed, uh, crashed his uh, guqin, the musical uh, instrument, and say, I'll never play it again because nobody else would understand me. So that's, that's what's behind the story. And so that, that also uh, shows how close at first the two, the, the, the man and, and, and the girl. Um, so I have to, to make that understood. Mm -hmm. mm. And then... Um... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. And we had a, a lovely question from Jinran, herself quite the acclaimed author. Hi, Jinran. And then <laughs> she, she was wondering a little bit about co-translation. And so why, what are the benefits to you for working with Will? And what, the next book we're going to come on to is also a co-translation. So we'll cover that a little bit as well. <laughs> That's a beautiful, beautiful question. And I think uh, uh, that comes... I think that, 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 that thanks to uh, Wang Lao Shi Wang, um, so on. and she gave me uh, two books to read, uh, like uh, first uh, Ding Yi's uh, Odyssey, the life, uh, Ding Yi's life, uh, and also uh, Su Tong's uh, Huang Chue Ji. Um, so when I read them, I can find something, you know, I'm, my native language was Chinese. Uh, I, my English is not too, not too bad, <laughs> the Chinese modesty, but you know, uh, for some of the subtleties, the day-to-day the, the, the -day dialogues, uh, the, I, I have to thank a lot uh, the uh, editor who worked with me uh, back and forth when I translated Zhang Wei's uh, Sounds of Forests. I learned a lot. So from that relationship, we found that, and also from my experience of reading others' translations, we found that the best, the best um, approach is to have a Chinese who knows the Chinese background and also uh, and, and, and an English translator and work together. So that way, and they can get a better product. I think. Thank you. I think that model is after. The uh, uh, also a British uh, uh, translator, uh, Yang Xianyi, and uh, his wife, who translated the dreams of Red Mansion. Yeah, that's that model. Yeah, no, I completely agree. I think it's a wonderful thing. Um, I think it's really wonderful, and you see it fairly often um, in other languages as well. And um, like, I think it's um, it's wonderful. Yep. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so we're going to move on to our fourth book of the morning um, called Set Dressing. Um, so joining me together are the co-translators. Uh, let's see if they can pop up on screen now. Um, we have Dr. Robin Gilbank and Professor, is it coming up? Oh, and Professor Hu Zongfeng. And that screen is black at the moment. Um, I'll just give them a second to go and find the camera again. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about set dressing. Um, set dressing is follows a, or should we watch the little clip actually? Let's do that. Um, from Shen. Uh, 非常高兴能今天参加这样一个会议。首先呢，我要感谢两位翻译家，同时也要感谢这个查斯出版社。
能够把这一部作品以不同的语种形式推荐给更多的读者。《庄台》这一部小说呢，在写作过程中其实来源于自己非常熟悉的一段生活。呃，作为创作者，我始终比较主张要写自己最熟悉的，呃，那些生活积累。这个庄台这个生活呢，刚好是我生活中可能接触比较多的一个部分。原来我在一个戏剧院团做管理者，同时呢，我也是一个编剧。哎，因为做编剧呀、啊，无论是做管理者，就跟庄台的这一帮工作人员就打得比较热火吧。庄台呢，应该说自世界戏剧的产生之日起，呃，他就和这个庄台大概有一定的关系。为什么呢？因为他要布置成一个舞台的样子呀。呃，后来又通过发展，他舞台会出现布景呀、道具呀等等这些东西。早期戏剧的状态其实它非常简单，但到后来，尤其到今天，舞台艺术的审美发生了巨大的变化，观众他的需求也不一样，因此呢，真山真水这些东西它都上去了，这个状态量就很大了。你比如说，有时候一台舞台演出，可能就用卡车要拉它的布景呀、啊，拉它的灯光，都是几十卡车。你想这么。庞大的劳动量，它其实就产生了一个特殊的队伍，就叫状态。作家呢，他是一个时代的书记员，也就是要记录他所处的这个时代的，呃，一些生活样貌。当然，呃，更重要的是要记录下这个时代人们心灵所走过的。那些路径和路程，既要有这个现实生活样貌的书写，同时呢，也要进入他们的心理深层，去思考一些东西，去展示一些，呃，人类可能我们还没有接触到的，呃，那么一些心灵的丰富性呀、啊，包括生活的丰富性在内。我想这这是，呃，作家的一个任务，在写庄台的过程中。我觉得写的还是比较顺利的，就是呃，因为熟悉，因为思考，这些人的时间比较长，呃，一些读者相对也比较喜欢，哎、呃，他们就觉得写的比较别样吧，啊，他毕竟是非常独特的一个生活群体，呃，舞台上我们看到的是主角的表演，是演员的表演，而他们做的。是大量的幕后工作，应该说他就是台前幕后啊，与别人搭建舞台，呃，有别人在上边去表演啊，呃，等等这些表演的人所表演的东西，与他们生活之间的关系，与他们心灵之间的关系等等，呃，这个小说企图就做这样一些方面的一些阐释吧。我因为对舞台生活比较熟悉，我同时也写了另外两部长篇。一个叫主角，一个叫喜剧，哎，他们有的把这叫舞台三部曲，它其实就是写台前幕后、喜剧、悲剧、台上台下，哎，这个物质、心灵等等，总体还是希望拉开一个更加广阔的社会生活背景，同时呢，也通过这种背景来开掘人的。呃，更加丰富多样的内心世界，呃，我想它这既有传统的因素，也有很现代的呃一些思考，呃，希望这个小说呢能够让大家喜欢，同时呢能够得到今天与会的专家学者的批评，谢谢大家。Hello, Robin. Um, and Professor Hu Songfang. Lovely to see you both. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you all good. How are you two today? Yes, it's、uh, just after seven after seven p.m. here, so <laughs> nice time of the day. <laughs> good. Thank you so much both for making the effort.、Um, we appreciate you staying late after work. Okay.
I think that was a kind of a, I think Mr. Chen gave us a kind of a blessing of an introduction there because he covered a lot of the, the key points about this novel. Shall I, shall I give an introduction now? Absolutely, please do. Please. So as he mentioned, this is, the, this is part of a trilogy. It's the first installment of a trilogy. And the, this one was, the first one was published in 2015. And the, the third was published only one year ago. So it's, it's very contemporary. Um, it's a trilogy, not in the sense that they're directly interlinked in terms of the uh, characters or the storylines, rather, as Mr. Chen said, that it, it revolves around the, the world of the theatre, uh, different groups of people who are associated with a particular aspect of the theatre or opera, specifically in, in Xi'an. So these work very well as, as standalone um, novels. So the people he presents here are what we've called, you might call them the set dressers, but we mostly refer to them as the stage shifters, um, because this is largely the male crew whose toil and graft allows theatre sets to be erected and arranged. So um, their, their position in the theatre is absolutely vital, even though they're not meant to be seen. Uh, you know, they're meant to be concealed. When the curtain rises, they're meant to sort of duck away and, um, you know, not be visible and maybe not be vocal either. So they create this space on which the directors and the actors can create art. Um, while they are not really meant to savor so much of the, the culture or the security or the, the recreation of, of the theater. So the main protagonist, um, Smooth Diao, heads the team of stage shifters, and he is constantly working as an, an intermediary an intermediary between the managers and the directors and his own um, kind of fractious and foul-mouthed uh, working team. So there's a lot of kind of knockabout humour and some uh, kind of language that will make your hair stand on end uh, going on there. Um, and so this is juxtaposed with what's going on in their own personal lives. And so the instigating event at the beginning of the novel is that Smooth gets married for the third time. He brings home um, a woman a dozen or so years younger than his, himself. And that really doesn't go down very well with his grown up daughter who also lives there. So there is a, a great deal of cat fighting and uh, it becomes very violent indeed in some places. So. It's a, it's a real mixed bag of a novel. Uh, there's a lot of humour, there's a poignancy, but um, it, it is a rather compelling um, narrative because at the heart of this, you have a character who is rather downtrodden in many ways, but his intentions are constantly good. Uh, so that's where a lot of the humour and a lot of the uh, interest in this novel arises from. Fantastic. That sounds amazing. I can't wait to read it. And just as a sort of recap for anyone, um, this novel will be coming out uh, last of the four of them in November this year, so we have got a little bit to wait. Um, I was wondering, um, Professor Huzong Feng, if you wanted to talk at all about the process of translating this book. Okay, hi. Can, can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. Hi. Uh, thank you for this <laughs> this chance today. Actually, for this um, more over ten years, we we, we two have been doing translation together, just like I uh, Yuan just mentioned, uh, Yang Yang Chen and Kanadis Yang are doing that. Uh, our translation co-translation is uh, almost the same pattern as that. And so I'm a native of Shanxi province, so I'm quite familiar with all the Term is a language. Uh, sometimes people say the, the language used by writers of Shanxi province is local dialect. But actually, they are not local dialect. They are classic Chinese. Means uh, in ancient times, right? People use that, that language. Even in daily talks, you know, even those 
ordinary farmers or the American in the daily part, the language they use are not local dialects, but very classic, very classic. And that's why we, when we cooperate with each other, at first, I can fully understand, right? All the language, because I'm not always born here, I grew up here, <laughs> educated here. And then we, Dr. Robin, the corporation, she's a, he's a PhD, right? Yeah, in literature. So, he, so that's why we've been doing this translation for, for over 10 years. I think this is the, so far, this is the best way, <laughs> my understanding. But it's also, I mean, but it's also with this particular book, because it's actually, it is set in the city where we live. Yeah. That Dean, who has lived here since 1978? Yeah, 1979. 1979. Yeah. <laughs> so he was one of the second, he was one of the second generation to come here to college when the college entrance exam was reinstated after the Cultural Revolution. So he's seen the city develop. And actually, uh, with several of the characters, they allude to the reform and opening up and how their fortunes have changed during this period. So it's something that he can relate to very closely. And actually, um, you know, being very familiar with the city, we know exactly the places where this is set. And we, uh, I guess we know people who fit into some of the types of the characters that feature in the novel. Uh, so it, it, it feels very familiar in, in many ways. And that sounds amazing. It's so interesting to hear this coming up again and again that in some ways you're in all the ways we can be better translators when we are um, more closely tied to a text just like a better author is more closely potentially more closely tied to their text as well um, were there any particular challenges with this book at all any things that we've talked a little bit about the ways in which it was easy and your favorite one yet was there anything that was particularly difficult You just prose. <laughs> Nothing is hard. <laughs> there's still there's still some things we're, we're still resolving. That there's some um, some that there's one or two places where it's maybe been a little bit overwritten. Where David, the, the editor, said that there might be a, a sentence or or two, or two that needs to be deleted here or there, which we we don't really like to do. But uh, with sort of thinking around those problems and also. Um, you know, some of the, the sayings and things um, require a little bit more thought. So, um, do you have an example? Yeah, it's our intention to keep all the original things. Because uh, as far as uh, I'm concerned, if an author, if a writer writes about that sentence, he or she must have his or her purpose in writing that sentence. So, you know, we, during our translation, we try our best to keep all the things original in, in the book. We will, we will. But, but in this case, I think this, this particular novel, um, it, it does actually flow quite smoothly. And I think the narrative structure, he works back very much by a structure of juxtaposition, things happening at the theater, happening at the stage and happening at home. And there's a few sort of forays into different local locations. So it's very engaging from the point of view of the, of the, of the reader. And actually, um, one of the things I really like about Mr. Chen's writing is that he's, a, I think he's a very modest man. He's not pretentious at all. When, when we approach this as being a book about, you know, setting the opera theater and things, I thought this was gonna be something quite um, grand and with lots of illusions and with lots of um, complicated literary uh, flourishes and things like that. But actually, the structuring of the novel may, means it's quite economical and, you know, is a, is a bit of a, a page turner, in my point of view anyway. We'll leave that to readers to decide. <laughs> Um, and you two have worked so long together um, that I was wondering um, what you advice you would give um, to younger translators and sort of the benefits of maybe finding a partner to work on translation with. Uh, 
<laughs> for, for younger, for young, sometimes we, we start from young, young. But nowadays, when things are very, very important, I think that especially for literary, I think it's not job of computer. Mm. Computer can be used as, a, before we may use as a dictionary or a consult or material or everything. But actually, so, so called this called data, I think is nothing. So we cannot totally depend on, on, on the computer. So we will be doing our even our way. If you want to translate the writer, you should write like the writer. That's now what they didn't mention that Mr. Chen's novel, he's describing about a smooth. Actually, his life is not smooth, right? But he's not smooth, but he has to carry on with his life. That's human life. Anybody's life is not smooth, but we must carry on. So when we want to, to translate, translation is not that smooth, right? But we also must carry on. So my suggestion to young translators have a profound knowledge of the language, and both the mother tongue or uh, foreign language. You must have a profound knowledge of that. If not, they better not do it. Oh, did it freeze there a second? And that was so good as well. Um, all right. Um, so if anyone has any questions, hopefully they'll be able to make it back in a second. Um, but if anyone has any questions for any of our speakers and translators today, um, or indeed for Daniel and Ying about their books coming out this year. Um, ah, we're back. <laughs> Do you want to finish what you were just saying? If, oh, sorry, uh, you're on mute. Uh, sorry, uh, you were on mute, um, just what you said. Are you uh, okay? I really was really enjoying that when it cut out. Okay. We, we didn't miss anything of what you said, so I think we're okay. We're, we're right. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Fab. All right. So I'm just going to um, open it to the floor. So if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, and whilst we wait for people to um, type those up, I guess my question um, for all of the translators here today um, is, how did you become a translator? And um, what, do you, what would you like? Um, what do you think is the most surprising thing um, about your job? You can pick either or. How did you become most surprising thing? Um, or you can answer both. Um, and let's start with uh, Dave, why not? <laughs> I'll put you on the spot. Sure. Um, so I guess before I became a, a translator, I became a, a reader of Chinese literature. Uh, I've been living in Beijing since 2007, and I can still kind of remember quite clearly the, like, the first time I kind of walked into a, a bookshop and just saw these shelves full of, of novels and poetry and just thought, wow, like if I, if I want to kind of experience this, I'm going to have to feed, figure out how to read it myself because um, only a tiny fraction of it is, is going to be available in English. So that was one of the, the kind of motivators for me to learn to read Chinese. And then uh, once my reading reached a kind of decent level, I just started translating by myself um, just to try and see how it went. Um, so my first translations, um, I started translating 10 years ago, which is a slightly scary thought. Uh, my first translations were just published on my own blog. Um, I reached out to authors who'd short, whose short stories I'd, I'd enjoyed and said, um, I'm an, an aspiring translator, I'd like to translate your work. And um, every, I think every author I ever contacted said, go for it, um, because none of them had really been translated before. So it was kind of an interesting novelty for them and they didn't really have anything to lose. Um, and I soon found that um, I really enjoyed, translating kind of has all the things that I enjoy about writing and less of the things, fewer of the things that I don't enjoy. Like you never have to kind of sit there in front of a blank page and just say, okay, what am I gonna do now? Um, you know, the material is always there and you are you are reworking it into, into English. So, um, the process, the, the best bits from my perspective of the process of writing are there in translation. Um, the bits that are the, the most frustrating at times are not there or are there to a much lesser extent. So I started translating on my own, on my own blog. And then um, once I'd kind of found my feet in there, I started sending them off to, to 
online literary journals and to magazines. Um, and then that's pretty much how it happened. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, how about you, um, Hai Wong Young? Okay. And uh, actually, I, I graduated from Nankai University's uh, Foreign Languages Department, and uh, I studied English. And uh, when I came to America with a Fulbright uh, grant, but the Fulbright scholarship required that I couldn't uh, pick English as my major. So I have to pay, pick one of the humanities, history. I thought it was close. <laughs> so I, well, that's why I got a history degree. And later, of course, another uh, uh, library information degree. But in the library, I had more time to write and translate. And so my passion, English is my passion, lifelong passion. And I love it. Because when I was a young uh, teenager, I saw my teacher reading, holding a huge book. And with the uh, little, uh, little letters, uh, words crammed on it, I said, can you read it? I said, yeah. I said, whoa, <laughs> I said, I will do it when I grow up. It turned out, I think it, it should be an encyclopedia. He was, <laughs> and uh, so that's my passion. And, and then I started writing I, as a librarian. I found a world series of folk tales and, you know, for coming um, from China, I said, uh, naturally, I will ask, do you have the Chinese series? I said, no. I said, can I contribute one? I said, wow. <laughs> and that started my writing about Chinese folk tales. But when you write folk tales, it's also involving some of the translations. You have to read the uh, original Chinese folk tales before you retell them. And, uh, and, and, and then uh, before my retirement, even after my retirement, uh, I'm just uh, devoted to this because I think a lot of people are, do, uh, are translating English into Chinese, but very few uh, Chinese guys translate Chinese into English. So I want to try that. I, 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 that's, that's a challenge, but I, I love to take challenges. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, and I'm wondering if I can go um, next to um, Robin and Hu Zongfeng again. And I was wondering, as you sort of answer this question about how you became translators, if you could also answer um, this really good question from Chet, um, who's asking that um, if my main goal in learning Chinese is to translate contemporary Chinese literature and culture for American audiences, um, is it worthwhile to laser focus my learning on reading and translating skills? Or if I neglect other elements of language such as speaking and listening um, will that harm my abilities as a translator um, should I focus in or should I become a good all-rounder I think okay, it depends. I can answer that though. oh I'm sorry go ahead I think it depends on what setting if you, if you are obviously if you're in America it's a difference between if you're living in America and if you're living in China obviously if you're living in China then there is more opportunity to speak and listen to Chinese on an everyday basis. So um, inevitably, I think the, I guess that the focus will shift towards uh, reading more, more if you are in a non-Chinese speaking country. But there have been some instances in the past, like um, Arthur Whaley, uh, the, uh, the British translator of Chinese poetry who never visited China or Japan and yet was a very great uh, translator. I wouldn't necessarily use him as a, a fine example for the present day because so much has changed in the 50 years or more since he died. So uh, it's not an easy question to come up with an answer to, I think. Yeah, just like uh, the, uh, the, the, the other uh, uh, professor said that uh, you cannot use the AI computer translation to translate literature. And so uh, without studying the other uh, uh, fields of English, it's like a machine translation. I think uh, you, have to, uh, you have to learn everything. In literature, you have dialogues, you have everything. So if you don't uh, study speaking English, how could you translate the dialogues? Mm -hmm. So there are different registers. And uh, like, uh, for instance, the uh, 
史铁生Steamy之旅 um, His dialogue is very Beijing, very Beijingese, Beijing dialect, like uh, Sun Zhe, <laughs> like uh, calling people bad names. And But his English is, is almost like a, a Wang Bo's uh, the Rhapsody. It's, it, 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 so it's, you have to learn everything about it. And because young students, you have a long time to go. We're all in our 60s, 70s, we're still translating, right? That's the best time to translate. So prepare yourself. You have to study, learn everything. So you have enough time to learn. And I'm going now to James and David. And um, there's a question for you specifically, James. Um, how would you compare the process of translating living authors with dead authors? And how does the ability to communicate with the author affect your decision making process? And I know that that might not be something you do. Some authors, uh, some translators ask authors lots of questions. Some try not to ask anything. <laughs> um, I was wondering what you thought about that. Uh, well, the only um, dead authors I've translated are Sun Tzu, Lao Tzu, and other stuff. <laughs> um, <laughs> I don't have that much experience in answering that. Um, I have to say the main problem would be not being able to refer to an author when, when you don't have the faintest idea what he's trying to say. Um, so I, I'm not sure I'm best equipped to answer that question. I would, however, like to answer another question, if I may briefly, or go back to the previous one. Um, uh, the, the question about whether how laser focused you should be on a specific, and I, and I think it's very important that you realize when you're translating a book, you're not just translating that text, you're translating a whole um, cultural context uh, in which, which the author inhabits. Um, and so the more you know, um, not just linguistically, but culturally as well, um, I think the better your translation is going to be. I, I spent some years. Um, not that long ago, actually trying to promote Mandarin as a primary school um, language and rather unsuccessfully in the end, I feel. I, um, but my, my main um, point was that if you're going to infuse students about learning Chinese, uh, you need to infuse them about China um, and that, that at least 50% of uh, teaching time should be spent uh, on investigating, exploring, many different aspects of Chinese culture and not just concentrating on the language because we in this country we have a, a fixation on, on languages in isolation from its culture and, and, and I think that's a mistake so my recommendation would be to actually to learn and study as broadly as you can because then you'll find it easier to focus. Absolutely I couldn't agree more. Sure. Um, <laughs> Uh, David, um, we've got a question here from Martin Savory, um, who's talking about um, character lists in the front of books. And as we've had a few um, mentions here of it being difficult to keep track of characters, um, what's your opinion on whether we should, you know, what's the use of character lists? Do you like using them? Do you not? Um, should we provide it when an author hasn't done it in the original? Um, should we, that be something we add in or not? It depends on the book, I think, and the number of characters, sheer number of characters in it. Um, I'm just reading at the moment the uh, Pomegranate Tree, which isn't a very long book particularly, but I'm, I'm making notes as I go along. And there's something like 35, 40 characters um, who need referencing because it is tricky to track what's going on. So my uh, preference would be to have a, a character list unless you're, you're dealing with just a, a few characters. I mean, you could ignore it if you want, but uh, I think it's useful to a lot of uh, foreign readers. Um, and so Christy then has a question for everybody, which is, um, what are the trends you are keeping an eye on in Chinese to English publishing and writing? Is there anything that you've noticed um, happening recently? Um, and anyone can take this who would like to, or I'll pick on someone. Um, maybe I could uh, give an answer. Um, for me, the the reading I've been doing most of lately is um, is more poetry than fiction, and um, I think there's a lot of exciting poetry that is just being shared online through WeChat accounts or or other kind of online platforms. I think the kind of immediate contact between um, between a poet and the reader um, opens up a lot of really exciting opportunities. And so um, my fiction reading has been uh, 
not so active lately. It's something I'm planning to kind of get back into, um, but I think there's a lot of exciting poetry, particularly being published uh, online at the moment. Anyone else want to chime in on that? That's something wonderful. No, then um, a further question is um, for somebody who's looking, Anna's asking, someone who's looking to start translating um, and that she's asking if folk tales and children's books are less demanding or easier genre for your first terms. And um, my suspicion is that I think I've heard um, many people talk about children's books as a very difficult skill. Um, so I was wondering if anyone has any thoughts on what could be a first um, work to translate. I've translated a series of Chinese uh, uh, books, but they translate from French. Mm -hmm. yeah, uh, the, the different com uh, Carmela is a very, very famous uh, French series of uh, picture books. And when you translate the children's books, so you need to uh, think about the language level. And uh, I happen to have a dictionary about children's language. So I just uh, compare with that. And also uh, sentences cannot be too long. And so that, that's sort of thing. I think any translation is not easy. Even the uh, folk tale of uh, uh, um, Mother Goose, or all these things. But if you translate the seven-year-old language, the, the words of a seven-year-old into the words of a 70-year-old, so what's the, what's the difference? So it's, you cannot look down upon any translation. As long as you put your heart into it, you will, you will use your brain. It's not easy. I don't agree with this idea. <laughs> I agree, and I think-, I think it, for, um, Sorry, go ahead. No, 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 you go, you go. I was gonna say, I think for any kind of book, you need to have read a lot of those types of book in the target, in the target language. So. Um, if you haven't read a lot of sci-fi books in English, it's going to be hard for you to translate a Chinese sci-fi novel into English um, in a way that, that reads well to, a, to an English reader. And the same is true of, of children's novels. They are a, a category of the book as well. If you're not reading a bunch of children's books, then um, I don't think it's easy to do a good job translating a children's book into English. Um, it has its own set of challenges. But certainly in terms of text length, I mean, just looking at the number of words, it's it's a smaller job to at least kind of test your skills on. But um, I think a kind of short story, even like a micro, an example of micro fiction um, would be a similar kind of length and is maybe more a kind of, you're developing the skills then that are more transferable to, to longer works of fiction. Whereas if you're looking at a, a children's book, that's a kind of, separate skill set of its own. Absolutely. And so then our last question that I'm going to go around and let everybody have a say on. And um, so we'll go in the order in which we talked about the books is, um, uh, let me just, it was about um, why, if you can both translate and write, um, why do you prefer, or do you prefer translation and why? And um, we could also interpret it um, if you wanted to as why do you like translation? And um, what would you say um, to our audience today about translation? And if we start with David and James. Um, yes. Why? Why do I? I find it very difficult actually to to explain why I enjoy translating so much. Um, except I, I suppose I mean I first I, I started doing it for fun when I was I was very young, um, and I only came into it professionally as it were very 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 late. But it's a way of um, expressing your own enjoyment and appreciation of a, of a culture or, or a literature that, that, has, that has grabbed you. Um, I suppose that's the, the main thing is, is, is the challenge of doing justice to something that you admire. Um, I suppose is, is, is what I, I feel. Um, I think it's privilege uh, and, and it's also probably the best learning opportunity um, you'll ever have uh, both linguistically and culturally if you're engaged with a, with a language. Um, I can't even remember what the question was, um, but it's, it's um, why it's, it's, 
I, 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 I sit there and, and I think someone else said this, and I look at the characters um, on the page in front of me, and the, my first thought is, um, how on earth am I going to put that into English? And then it's that the whole process of engaging um, different thinking skills from your norm, the ones in your normal language, uh, to apply to this new language, and then processing it back into your own, um, is is a. I mean, it's an intellectual challenge, but it's also the most intellectual fun I think you can have. Um, so, you know. Basically, it's just a jolly good laugh, I think, translating. Um, it's, it, it gives me endless enjoyment um, and endless frustration. Um, what more can you ask? <laughs> Absolutely. Um, and then Dave for me. Um, yeah, I think James put it really well. Um, you still got the, the kind of pleasure of just constructing sentences, just that, that kind of the the joy of putting words together that you get in in writing something by yourself or in translating something you also get the the pleasure of a reader like it's kind of the one of the deepest ways i think you can read a text when you when you are translating it you have to um you know it sometimes feels like when you're translating a text that hasn't been translated before like no one has paid as much attention to this text before as you have the way you're like going through every single detail, every single sentence, just um, trying to figure it out and just giving it that degree of attention. Um, so there's the writing pleasure, there's the reading pleasure. Um, and yeah, it sort of overlaps with the, the kind of muscles that you're using when you're writing something for yourself. Um, but then it also has these, these other pleasures, um, like James said, of kind of solving solving challenges, overcoming those problems when you kind of struggle with trying to figure out something um, and it just it just clicks into place. Um, or when one of the things that makes me happiest is when I'm I'm working on my second draft and I come across a paragraph and like the first the first go at it, it was fine, right? Like there's nothing I need to change. I just nailed it the first time. Thanks, past version of me. Like that one just came out and uh and it works. Like that's also uh, one of the pleasures I get from translating. Thank you, and Mr. Yan. Okay, and actually, uh, I shift from writing to translation. But even during the writing, I was not writing uh, stories myself. I was writing re re retelling the Chinese stories and uh, writing about languages and others, uh, politics and stuff. But uh, I don't think I am a good writer. Uh, so that's why I just take advantage of my talent for English language instead of uh, non-talent non for writing <laughs> stories. So that's why, that's why. And, uh, and also it's a different fun. You, as a writer, you, you try to tell your own story to the reader. But as translator, it's kind of like uh, introducing someone to someone they, they, they didn't know each other at all with different cultural background, cultural bags, and how you make them understand each other. That's, that's kind of a, a different fun for me. Thank you. Thank you. And um, Mr. Zongfang and Robin. Um, I think, I, I agree with what's being said. I think there is a pleasure that if you're making something available to somebody, uh, some knowledge or information or just a, a cracky good story, if you're making that available to somebody who wouldn't be able to access that otherwise, um, albeit in your version, then there's a great satisfaction in doing that and in getting the response from readers who, you know, with a lot of there's a lot of, of uh, people who, you know, they, they, they may just grab a Chinese novel in translation by ra quite randomly. They may just dip into this and be pleasantly surprised by what they find. So it, it, there's, a, there's a kind of uh, a, 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 a eureka going on there, I think. You want the last word? <laughs> For me, I think uh, translation is a lifelong hobby. Just they have said us there are different flavors. Uh, and one flavor. There is also the flavor of creation. 
translation sometimes also is a creation. It's not simply just translation. Sometimes it is very, very interesting when you found the things between the two languages, or you just uh, express the, the thing in, in your mind, on your mind, then out in Havana language. It really brings you pleasure and happiness. But one thing in China is that we cannot make a living by translation. <laughs> it is too hard. It's the way. <laughs> Um, well, uh, we have sadly come to the end of our session today. Um, I just want to thank everybody so much for coming and I want to thank you all. Thank you. So thank no. you. Oh, it's been a pleasure and a huge thank you also to Daniel and Ying and Anna um, and everyone in Queen Mary University. It's lovely to see you all. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> um, and a few little things to wrap up um, if you want to buy so these books aren't out yet they're coming out in um, June August and November this year um, but Sinois does have plenty of other books um, often translated by these very faces we've seen here today um, so if you want to go um, to sinoisbooks.com um, and there is a subscription scheme and all of these books, except for Leading Wave, will be on the subscription scheme. Um, so if you want to sign up for a subscription, you can also get 10% off with the code CLRCUK10. Um, and yeah, I think that is it from all of us. Um, please do join us again in the future. Um, we'll keep an eye on our socials and our, your emails. Um, we'll be dropping you some emails about our future events coming up in March and April. Um, so thank you all so much for coming and thank you all so much for speaking. I shall see you all soon.